Thank, Thank you. you. Today I'm going to tell you three stories. The first one takes place on the Bering Sea. I think I'm going to need two hands for these stories. <clears throat> it's an area called Bristol Bay with huge lakes and, and rivers, rivers that are one, two kilometers wide at the mouth, and it supports a run of wild salmon. About 60 million fish return every year. Now, as you know, salmon return to the rivers in which they were born. So nobody fishes for salmon in the middle of the North Pacific. We fish for them around, in and around the mouths of the rivers. So in order to, to regulate this fishery, biologists have sort of drawn an area, an enclosure, we call it a box, around the river. So pretend I'm standing in the middle of the Igigik River, huge river, <clears throat> looking at the Bering Sea. There's a line, the west line, then there's a south line that hits the beach here, and a north line. Okay? You can fish inside the box, you can't fish outside. Second thing you probably know about salmon is they tend to swim with the tides, not against them, the ebbs and the floods. So when millions of these salmon flood up into the Bristol Bay, those that are heading for the Igigik River will then ebb down across that north line, just pour into this box. <clears throat> so you figured out probably the most popular strategy of fishing in Igigik, that is put your net on the north line, right? Then you have an un unimpeded flow of fish into your net. Sounds easy. It's not quite as easy as it sounds. Uh, there are about five, six hundred other boats that have exactly that same plan. Uh, and secondly, not only is the, are the, the water and the fish moving across this line, this north line, you find it with GPS, sort of a digital line, everything else is, your boat is, your net is, all the other 600 boats and their nets are. So by the time you've, full speed, you're laying out a 100-fathom net, you know, a 300-meter-long net, full speed, you're laying that out, takes you maybe three, four minutes. <clears throat> by the time you've got that laid out, of course, what you were, you've drifted way, way, way off that north line. Everything is just flying in on the ebb into this box in the Igigik River. Unfortunately, the other fishermen aren't waiting three or four minutes for you to get your net out so they can set their net out, right? They're not waiting at all. There's a boat here, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. You're standing on a deck, and you're like, uh -huh. there it is. So 10 meters behind you, they're laying out. Hundreds of nets, right? Hundreds, like some weird swimming pool, just moving into the, into the box. And you're picking fish as fast as you can. You don't even wait to get the net back on board. It's two-thirds on board. You haul the rest back, and you're charging back for the line. Clean it while you're on the way. Full throttle. You don't go around nets. We're going over nets. Pull it out of gear, there's the net, back into gear, back to the north line, jog and set it out again. It's crazy. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <clears throat> this picture is actually fuzzy because it's true. <laughs> this one is taken from some video that my buddy Kyle shot, thank you Kyle, uh, of us when we were fishing together up in, the, up in Bristol Bay. So that means old video like this. We took the clearest screenshot we could get. <laughs> so it looks like that. It looks like a war zone. It looks like that, but about a million times more. And think three dimension, five senses. So anyway, I told this story to my, uh, one of my daughters a couple weeks ago, and she asked the smart question, how do any survive? <laughs> how can you have a fishery there? And I said, actually, they survive. Actually, it's booming. Actually, we have a record every year. She said, how is that possible? I said, there's a principle of management here. Optimize the future, ensure the future, and then you maximize the present. So it's very high level. How does it look concretely in Bristol Bay? There are about 160 pages of regulations. I'm not going to run you through it right now, but the most obvious one is managing fishing time. So when a salmon swims safely upriver so it can reproduce, it is considered to have escaped. So, and this fishery is managed not for over-escapement or under-escapement, but for optimal escapement. <clears throat> Beginning of the season, middle of June, late June, we're given a couple hours to fish. Maybe we don't even, we're not even given an ebb. A little bit of slack tide, some flood. And as the daily returns come in, and there are people counting fish, one, two, 75. As the daily returns come in, as we're getting our escapement, we get more and more and more fishing time. So, and by the end, by July 7th, 10th, we'll get three or four days in a row. Uh, middle of July, they'll open the thing up, maybe. So, 
we want to take the risk. We've reached the optimal escapement, and now it's about, not only now, but every day, it's also about maximizing the present. So, secure the future. Priority one is clearly getting the escapement. No escapement, no fishing. But they're not ignoring the incentives of maximizing the present. And one of the things that that's done, interestingly, as a side effect, is it's led to investments in quality. So, refrigeration, different ways of protecting the caught fish, maximize the price that we get. So it's led as a side effect to a move away from quantity, just get as much as you can at the cheapest cost possible to making investments that only pay off in the future, investments in quality. So it's, it's, kind of, it's an interesting lesson in sustainability um, that we can take out of Bristol Bay fishing. So take a second, let that soak in. Optimize the future and then maximize the present. Go for it in the present. But you can't take too long because I've got another story to tell you. This is togiak. <clears throat> and this is herring. Herring is not a salmon. That means it's a different fish, a uh, different fishery. So salmon is, you know, comes back, heads more or less directly to the river in which it was born. Herring are a different thing. They hang out in the North Pacific. They decide it's time to come in. They come up and warm themselves up on the water right on the beaches of Togiak Bay, and then they do their reproduction and let billions of eggs go. The males do their thing, and then they head back out to the North Pacific for a couple years. So Togiak Bay, so that's what the herrings do, the herring do. So you can't catch them in the mouths of the river like the salmon. Togiak Bay is enormous. I have a feeling I've spent weeks or months of my life circling Togiak Bay. It can take, easily take you 45 minutes to fly from one area of it to the other. So unsurprisingly, fishing boats have partnered with pilots. The pilots can cover that area quickly, spot the fish, depending on the weather and the, the wind conditions. You can see the herring pretty well from the air. They can spot the fish and communicate where they are to the boats, right? Put the boats on them. These kind of partnerships we call, we call these pilots herring spotters. <clears throat> Last time I fished, and that's how I worked in Togiak. Last time I worked in Togiak, I fished in Togiak as a herring spotter. The fleet took a little over 200 boats, took 15,000 tons in 10 minutes. So 15,000 tons in 10 minutes. So you're right, 15,000 tons, that sounds like a hell of a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes, that sounds like a real short time. Right. So, um, you got 200 plus boats. They're up there for a month. The herring are coming in. We know the belugas are hitting on them. The gulls are on them. The walruses are on them. They're coming closer. They're not ready. Are they coming to the beach? No, they're not warmed up. They're up there at least a month, a week, maybe two weeks preparation. 200 boats, five large guys on each boat. They're eating. They're burning diesel. They're working through, they're, they're wearing out their gear. Mom, put it on pause right now for a second. Because you also got 50 or 60 airplanes up there. They're burning aviation gas. It's very expensive. They're putting time on their engines. They're wearing out their equipment. Mm -hmm. Ah, and by the way, you may not know, nobody gets paid to fish. Nobody gets paid to fish. You get paid to catch. You don't catch, you don't get paid. Boats don't get paid unless they catch fish. Pilots don't get paid unless their boats catch fish. You see where this is going. There are hundreds of people, there's millions of dollars of capital trying to make a season in 10 minutes. Makes the hair stand up on, my back, on the back of my neck when I remember this. <clears throat> uh, it's okay. It's going to be okay. It sort of looks like this, except when I look at this, I think it doesn't look like that at all. <laughs> it's like about a million times more than that. So, anyway, what this situation led to, which is relevant for us today, is that the pilots got together at some point and said, no matter whether the weather is 500 feet or 5,000 feet, there's not enough sky to go around. There's not enough sky to go around. We can't make it work in the present like this, and there's not going to be any future. So, what they did is now interesting. <clears throat> they didn't actually talk about it. Uh, they didn't wait for some sort of a formal set of rules, like in Bristol Bay. They got together and they said, we're going to do something informal right now. We've got to figure out a way to share this scared resource so that we've got it in the future, but also in the present. 
And they, and, and they formed a series of, of, of informal rules. And I'm going to tell you four of them right now. One is about the beach. You always keep the beach on your left. The beach is where all the action happens, right? So the beach is always on your left. You're, this is the beach. You're flying this way. You're flying this way. Only left turns. Only circling to the left. We're trying to bring some sort of order into the chaos. So you know when you're like 50 feet behind another airplane and you're looking at the fish in the water, somehow you know it won't turn to the right. Always two people in a plane. It's safer in a plane. Uh, and hold your altitude during this 10 minutes, during the half hour before it, during the two hours before it. Hold your damn altitude. None of this sort of diving down to check out how your boat is doing, how the catch looks. So from the situation of there's not enough sky to go around to a way of sharing that, which makes sense in the present and in the future. Small group, informal, actually doing rather than talking about it. So that was fish. That fishing was in the past. I live in Switzerland now. I'm married to a gorgeous Italian woman. I have two kids. Um, I'm, I'm working, I'm taking these experiences, lessons from these experiences and others, and I'm actually helping firms plan sustainably for the future. So in my focus, the last three years, as you read in the bio, has been with the SBB, where I've been tracking transportation and mobility trends here in Switzerland. So the third story then is about transportation mobility. Uh, let's start with people. Statistically, in the last 20 years here in Switzerland, Oh, sorry, I need to introduce this picture also. This is Switzerland, as you see. This is when uh, uh, my wife came home one day and couldn't get in the door, right? So, <clears throat> uh, in the last 20 years, we in Switzerland have added almost 2 million cars to the roads. 2000, there were 4.5 million. At the end of 2021, there are going to be 6.3. We've added almost 2 million cars to the roads. I was driving in Switzerland in 2000. The roads were not empty. Also, my Swiss friends were making fun of the Americans. You guys, you guys love traffic jams. You love two-hour commute. They say, it's so fun. I go to California. I ask, where's the gym? The answer is, well, it depends what time you're going. It's either 15 minutes or an hour. I'll tell you what. Well, I'm not, they're not laughing now. <laughs> I said, we are California. <clears throat> so I live in a town a little, bit, a little bit outside of Zurich. You want to know how far outside of Zurich we are? Depends on what time. It's either 30 minutes or an hour and a half. I mean, at a quarter to six in the morning, the road coming down into our village is bumper to bumper, packed with cars. And they're not shift workers trying to make the six o'clock shift at all the huge factories in our little village. Right? They're trying to get to Zurich in a half an hour instead of in an hour and a half or two hours. So it's not just people either. It's, it's stuff. It's the last mile logistics, it's delivery. <clears throat> I mean, home office has been a revelation for me. I look out my window, I feel like I could write a book on logistics in Switzerland. So I see everybody, I see everybody two times a day. DHL, the post, you name them, they're there. And I live on a street, a side street, you know, speed limit is 30. So I'm not on a, on a big street. I see everyone. I see vans that say, you can rent me on the van. At first, the first time I saw one, I thought, ah, oh, someone's moving. Oh, well, I wonder if they're moving nearby. And then like the fifth time I saw one and a guy from DHL hopped out of it, I said, nobody's moving, Tom. Okay. I mean, this is exploding so fast that the fleet, they can't handle, you know, the, the, they can't handle it with their own fleets. They're delivering stuff out of vans that say, you can rent me. <clears throat> I visited a friend in Zork a couple weeks ago who lives in an apartment and the entryway to the apartment looks like a warehouse. I mean, you can't get in. And we've got business models now. Next day delivery, this day delivery. You know, it's a Londo where you order 10 pounds of stuff and immediately send nine pounds back. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, not, it's out of control. Statistically as well, you know, you know WEF is the World Economic Forum has told us to expect a future which is also going straight up. I mean, since two th we know e-commerce has boomed since 2000, and we know that's brought a huge increase in last mile logistics, package delivery, all sorts of stuff. We know COVID has given it a huge push. Last estimate I read from WEF was 25% increase. 
Um, and they're predicting between now and 2030, 100, 100 biggest cities in the world, another almost 40% increase in the traffic generated by last mile delivery. I mean, it can't I mean, help. It can't continue. How many, how many lanes did we just add to the north side of Zurich? It's not a joke to say we are California. So, I mean, more of the same is not the solution. Just more of the same cannot be the solution. Okay, Tom, what's the solution? Huh. Here, as you know now, I think we can take some lessons from the Bering Sea. We can take some lessons in sustainability from these fisheries. So the first one is, it's the, from, from Togiak, these herring spotters, it starts with recognizing or admitting there's not enough sky to go around. So you can substitute sky for a whole bunch of different things, but we don't get permanent solutions until we realize, hey, no matter how good the weather is, there's not a, under no conditions, there's not enough sky to go around. Lesson two that I take from Bristol Bay is this designing interventions based on this principle. First priority one is clearly we've got to have a future. We've got to ensure the future. We've got to optimize for the future. But priority two, that's not sufficient. Priority two is to maximize the present. We need incentives also in the present. And when we do that, we could expect, just like in Bristol Bay, other interesting side effects, interesting positive ones, like these sort of investments in quality rather than sort of a race to the, the cheapest way to get the most possible today. So, and the third lesson I think we can take from these examples, from both of them, is about doing. It's about small groups. So, it's about less UN-level Glasgow talking. I mean, the, the, the herring spotters didn't wait for somebody to solve it for them, right? It's about local, informal, small groups. The larger the group, the more free riders you get, the, more, the harder it is to get consensus that there's not enough sky to go around in the first place. So this is a third lesson I think we can take is start small. You know, do small. There's certainly plenty of people willing to talk on the big level. Do small. That's not even a good, that's not even correct English. So, um, every salmon fishery in the world is attracted by the success of Bristol Bay. Every herring fishery in the world is attracted by the success of Togiak. So instead of begging, trying to convince people to sacrifice, also, let the small, local, small group success, let the attractiveness of these successes inspire other people to join us. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>